Greetings, folks, and welcome to Grace. Uh, we've been looking at marriage from the pen of the Apostle Paul, and when we left off in our previous session, we were focusing on Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 through 27. So let's uh, read through that section once again, and then we'll pick it up where we left off in that lesson. Paul was directing his comments to the wives as we began um, our text in Ephesians 5, verse 22, where he he gives this exhortation to married women. Watch with me here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is the idea there, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Moving to verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now this is where we began to look at that parallel uh, picture, parallel structure that Paul's painting uh, for us in this passage. And what Paul's doing here, by way of a, a marvelous illustration, uh, is drawing a comparison in the roles of the marriage partners in two different marriage relationships. Uh, first, he likens Christ's role as the head of his union relationship with the church, uh, that is his body, to the husband's role um, as the head of his marriage relationship and his union with his wife. So Paul draws this picture. What makes his parallel structure most interesting? is that he tells the husbands in verse 25, as we just read there, that they are to love their wives even as, or we might even say in the same manner that Christ loved the church. Um, we know that Christ loved the church in a particular manner, and the husband is to use that same pattern when it comes to the way that he's to love his wife or to express his love for his wife. Of course, we know that Christ willingly gave his life at Calvary for uh, uh, for us, so Christ's love was a sacrificial love. We understand that. But there's more to Paul's parallel picture there than loving in a sacrificial manner. And this is what I want you to see. Notice verse 25 uh, with me once again. Husbands, love your wives even as, in the same manner that, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. But notice Paul didn't end his sentence with the word church there. The word and appears after the word uh, church. Uh, Christ loved the church in a particular manner, for sure. That was by meeting the needs uh, of those who would belong to him in union relationship, uh, otherwise called his body. But Paul adds that word and there, as you can see. He adds the word and there uh, to that statement to show that Christ willingly gave himself in order to accomplish me the meeting of the needs of the church. We could say it this way. Christ met his union partner's needs but on top of that, he willingly sacrificed himself in order to meet those needs. Uh, in like manner, God designated the husbands uh, to be the head of their wives in order that the husbands might meet the needs of their marriage partners. And, according to the parallel structure, husbands should do this in a sacrificial manner. Uh, but here's something every husband and wife uh, should understand. Christ did not give himself for us and accomplish the meaning of our needs by sacrificing himself on our behalf in order to boss us around uh, or to give us a list of rules and, and regulations uh, that we'd be required to follow or to keep, uh, to keep us under his thumb in a manner of speaking, uh, in his insistence that we walk right and talk right from that point on out. Uh, Christ's love for us was a no-demands type of love, uh, a no-requirements type of love. That's how he loved us. Uh, we might call it a no-strings-attached love for his union partner. The simple fact is, love that comes with demands uh, is not love at all in actuality. According to the Apostle Paul, you'd have to call it something else, whatever title you'd like to give it, but it wouldn't be love. Love makes no demands, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, commonly known as the love chapter of that epistle. That's what the expression, seeketh not her own, is all about. Uh, love is also not a feeling, according to the Apostle Paul. Now, a feeling may accompany it, for sure, but love itself is not the feeling. It's an action word. It's a commitment. It's a commitment to act for the betterment of the recipient of that love. That's what agape love is all about. Love is expressed with the hope of eliciting a willing response to that love. Uh, but it does not demand that response. 
Uh, love with a demanded response would be nothing more than law. Uh, John stated it best. Uh, the best way it could be stated, I believe, when he said it to Israel in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love him, and notice this next word, we love him because he first loved us. Action shown, response to the action shown. That's the order. Christ willingly gave himself a ransom for all. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 6, Christ gifted himself. And he gifted himself, uh, he gifted himself as a proper way of expressing it. Nothing required in return that we might respond on our own uh, by simply accepting the gift of his love, uh, that, that, that his love purchased for us, which is eternal life uh, with him. And then willingly in love, in appreciation for his matchless love for us, respond to the way he loved us. In like manner, Paul tells us, in like manner as Paul's parallel picture illustrates, when a husband willingly commits himself, offers himself, gives himself over, he, Christ sacrificed himself, um, submits himself to meeting the needs of his wife. And not to meeting the demands of his wife, but to meeting the needs of his wife. Uh, that wife can respond in willing submission to her loving husband. Uh, but you see, there was an order of things. Uh, there was a definite, defined order when it came to Christ and the expression of his love for the church that is his body. Uh, it's sometimes taught that men are not properly loving their wives because those wives are not properly honoring or reverencing their husbands. If that wife would just start honoring that husband of hers and show it uh, in a way that he can feel it, that he knows it, then he'd begin fulfilling his part of that mar marital bargain. But uh, we can see that the love boat sailing in the proper direction and, and instead of simply, cir uh, simply circling the port uh, is what this idea, this teaching is all about. Well, if that wife would submit, then the husband could willingly take the lead. Uh, imagine Christ's relationship with the church that is his body. Uh, as it's oftentimes taught in current religious writings, uh, concerning husbands and wives today, think about the way it's taught. Picture Christ on one hand, here he is, and the church is on the other. These two are union partners, joined together as one. It's a true marriage relationship. Then picture a third party trying to get both of these marriage partners to make this union relationship work in an appropriate manner. All right, the third party says, I want you both to begin meeting one another's needs. Surely you two can do that. When I say ready, you're to both begin. And maybe we can put an end to the treadmill this relationship's been on. One, two, three, begin. Christ, the husband, interjects. If the church would just show me a little more respect, uh, why, then I could show that church more love. Uh, the problem is I'm not getting the respect that I'm properly due uh, the third party intercedes once again at this point. Perhaps he's right, church. Uh, the reason he's not blessing you like you ought to be blessed is because you're not giving him the respect that he's due. Uh, if you want him to bless you, you need to begin honoring that, that, that husband of yours. Now, does that sound a little bit like uh, an answer that religion might give? Uh, why, if you'll go first, wife, your husband will respond in like manner. You start showing the respect your husband deserves, and then your husband can respond, and then he can love you like you really want to be loved. Uh, well, believe it or not, that's how religionity perceives the marital relationship. Church, begin doing your part for God, and then God will begin blessing you like you'd like to be blessed. Um, if you must go first, church, then go first. Someone has to get this show on the road. Uh, do your part, church, and then God will do his. And I'm sure you've heard that. It's taught in uh, some current books on marriage. That might sound good on the surface. It might sound like the right way, but that isn't how it worked with Christ and his union partner, the church. You see, the church that is Christ's body has the wife role in Paul's parallel relationship, his parallel illustration. According to Paul's picture, Christ is the husband, the head, the church, is his wife in this union arrangement. Uh, look at Paul's illustration once again, and you tell me, is the wife to show the husband due respect in hope that her husband, Christ in this case, will eventually respond by loving her the way that she wants to be loved? Um, are you teaching it like the Bible portrays it? We might ask some of the, some of the marriage uh, writers. Or are we teaching it like religiondom would have it? Uh, are both marriage partners to begin performing on behalf of the other at the same time? Or was it the role Christ played to first demonstrate his love for those who would be joined to him in order that a favorable response might willingly come 
from those already loved and blessed apart from the prior performance or commitment of the other, the wife. Now, how did it work with Christ in the church that is his body? Let's think about it for a moment. The husband played the headship role, uh, the, or the lead role, we might say. Christ is the head of the church. In, in demonstrating his love for us, and the wife, the church in Paul's marriage illustration, played the respondent role. We are the responders, folks. Uh, not the initiators. We're not always the rapid responders, but we are the be the responders, not the initiators, when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Religianity would turn that around with the advice that if we will do our best for God, then we can expect that God will respond with doing his best for us. Uh, well, little wonder when looking at husbands and wives, those of a religious mindset might say, wives, if you'll demonstrate your respect, more respect, your husbands will more likely fall into line. What faulty reasoning. My contention... I believe is Paul's contention, and Paul's parallel structure uh, uh, points this out. I'm convinced it does. The demonstration precedes the response, not the other way around. Uh, religianity's contention is that if you want God to bless you, give him the reverence that he's due, and then you can expect him to bless you. Paul's contention, on the other hand, is God reconciled you and blessed you totally apart from your performance. You are now free, having become the recipient of all that Christ accomplished for you at Calvary, to willingly respond with the reverence the one who has blessed you is due. It's, it's, uh, it's demonstration followed by um, respect. You see the difference there. I want, you to, I want to take you back to two important verses in this passage in order that we might see more clearly that it's the husband's demonstration that leads to it's the husband's dis, uh, demonstration that elicit or prompts, we might say, the wife's reciprocation. Uh, as I said earlier, demonstration precedes reciprocation, always when it comes to Christ and the church. Please keep this in mind. Husbands need to know this because it's the biblical order when it comes to headship and submission as God's word teaches it. Demonstration, appreciation, reciprocation. That's the divine order. Demonstration, appreciation, reciprocation. That was God's intended order, and that demonstration part of that order of events is the responsibility of none other but the husband, whether or not the reciprocation of the wife follows after. Notice with me Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 once again. Husbands, love your wives even as in the same manner that Christ also loved the church. We're not going back to law here. We're going back to, we're going to a grace relationship here, and Christ gave himself for the church. So, all right, here we have Christ's sacrifice of himself for the sake of meeting our needs, the needs of the church, his union partner. Uh, this demonstration by Christ was made prior to any response at all by any of us. Uh, the Bible tells us that he loved us when we were yet enemies. And you can look that up in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. He loved us when we were yet his enemies. Of course, we're going to see a, a purpose clause coming in the next verse. Verse 27 uh, follow with me here and, and watch me closely to see if I read this verse as it's written. I like to change things around a bit. Once again, I'll begin with verse 25 to lead things off, and then you watch very closely the wording of verse 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now here comes the watch me closely part. That the church might present, <laughs> that the church might present herself back to Christ a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Is that how the verse reads? That the church might present herself back to Christ. It doesn't read that way, does it? That's how religiondom looks at it, but, and that's how it's often interpreted, but that's not how the verse reads. Look back at that text once again and answer this question. Does it say here that the church might present herself back to Christ in a particular manner? Or does it say that Christ might present the church back to himself, a glorious church? Which is it? Uh, who's doing the presenting in this passage? Look at it again. That he, the husband, not that she, the wife, but that he, the husband, might present the church, his wife, to himself, a glorious church, uh, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What I want you to see in this passage is that Christ loved the church in a particular manner in order that he might present the church back to himself in a certain way. When it, when it comes to Christ and his union partner, uh, the church, 
Who was it that was directly responsible uh, for the presentation spoken of in this passage? Uh, it was the husband. It was, it was the husband so that he might, subjunctive mood, a possibility so that he might present his union partner back to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, as the passage says, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and, and without blemish. What we may not have readily recognized on the surface is that the way a wife is presented to her husband, in other words, how glorious the husband wants the wife's presentation to be, is the direct responsibility of the husband. Uh, love your wife even as, just in the same way that Christ loved the church, and the likelihood is far greater that you'll end up with a glorious presentation. Love her as one concerned uh, more for your own needs than you are in meeting her needs, Ignore her as though she's nothing more than a, a period at the end of your sentence. Uh, treat her as though your continued love for her is dependent upon her response to your position as her head. And what would be a proper anonym for the word glorious? I guess uh, inglorious. <laughs> you see a, a principle sitting here in Paul's parallel picture. He's telling us something, folks. The problem in marriages today is that both are waiting on the demonstration of the other before they're willing to serve the other. Uh, self is sitting on the throne of our lives. But if Paul is correct, and I'm sure that he is, the role of initiator, primary love demonstrator, always lies with the husbands. Of course, they don't always want to hear that, do we guys? Uh, is, is it always true that husbands do not want to demonstrate their love for their wives or to be the first, we might say, with that demonstration? Is that always true? Or is it possible that many husbands just simply don't know how to love their wives in a manner that best meets the needs of the wives. Uh, you see, we have to know what a wife needs in order to be able to respond or to meet those needs. The question is, where are those needs being taught? Where do we see the, the wife's needs being taught? Where can we find them? Where can we, can we go to look them up? Uh, the answer to that question sits right here in Paul's parallel illustration. A description of the things that God knew every wife would need uh, is provided. It's sitting here. It's provided by Paul right here in this passage. Now, most of us married guys just didn't know where to look for them, but they're here. Uh, the more self-focused we become in our marriage relationships, the less we're looking for the wife's needs in the first place. We're looking for our own needs to be met. Knowing how Christ loved the church tells us the needs of the church. Uh, in turn, or we might say likewise, knowing how Christ loved the church by meeting our needs uh, is, that's telling us husbands how to love our wives in order to best meet their needs. So how did Christ love the church? Let's bring it back full circle. If we can discover how he loved the church, we can discover the needs of the church. And the parallel structure tells us that would be the, the needs of the wives. We found that answer. The answer to that lies in the epistle Paul wrote where he explained and he expounded on what Christ accomplished for us, the church. The epistle that tells us what he accomplished for us is the epistle that tells us our needs, the needs that God knew we would have. Uh, who can recall that epistle? Well, sure, it's, it's the book of Romans, the letter we've called Paul's Handbook on Faith. Uh, Romans is the book uh, where we learn how Christ loved the church uh, and how Christ met the needs of the church. Uh, it's, it's the book where we discover what Christ accomplished for the church. Now, as we noted in our earlier study, Romans, Paul's faith foundation, is laid out for us in four doctrinal sections. If you took a foundation stone and a foundation and pulled it right up, straight up on your desktop there so you could see it, uh, you could see the four sections or cornerstones, we called them, of Romans. Uh, the first cornerstone covering the first five chapters of Romans tells us about our justification. This is a need. This is a great need for the church. Obviously, God knew that justification would be the primary or the major need of the church. Romans begins with this doctrinal statement. The church, comprised of believers, would need to be the recipients of a gift declaration of righteousness. Uh, and it's called justification. It was in this first cornerstone of Romans that we learned what justification is all about and how being justified freely by his grace comes totally apart uh, from the believer's performance or the believer's promise. We are justified by faith alone in the faithfulness of Christ alone as Christ alone became our all-sufficient sacrifice at Calvary. No production, no performance, no promise, no commitment having been provided by the recipients of God's gift of righteousness decree. Uh, one of the verses we noted was Romans chapter 4 verse 5 where Paul states, 
but to him that worketh not. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the godly or the ungodly. What does it say there? It justifieth the ungodly, that person's faith, not his works, not his efforts, not the best he can do, but his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, we didn't work for this gift decree of righteousness. Uh, we don't deserve it. We could, we could never earn it. We can't barter for it. We also cannot lose it, and that's a fact. Um, so what, what did we call this first accomplishment of Christ? This magnificent demonstration of his love for us while we were yet enemies, we called it justification. And justification to us is a safe place. Uh, that tells us a great need that we, that we had as enemies of God. We needed a safe place. Uh, in this first cornerstone of Romans, we learn that Christ accomplished for the church, those who would believe him, uh, his wife in this marriage illustration, we, he provided for us a safe place. What does that tell us about our greatest need? What should that in turn tell us about the wife's greatest need? If we carry this back to Paul's parallel illustration, his parallel marriage picture, a safe place will be every wife's greatest need in her marriage relationship. But let's not stop there. Let's apply the safe place that husbands are to provide for their wives to the areas where marriages come apart at the seams. Now, I, I know you'll recall those categories. We'll pull them up here once again. They all began with the letter F, and there they are. Uh, let's take a quick look at these one at a time and see how husbands can provide their wives a safe place uh, in each of these areas rather than beginning with finance. Now, that's what we started out with first because that's where marriages break apart most often, but we'll, uh, we're told that's the leading cause of marriage sundering. It's been so for decades, internet pornography making such a rapid rise that uh, some people would put that ahead of finance now, but we'll begin where every marriage should begin, and that's with that area called faith, the faith foundation. How can a husband provide his wife a safe place when it comes to that area of faith? I want you to think about it for a moment. How would you supply uh, or provide the need for your wife when it comes to that category called faith? Who do you suppose is, is, uh, most often has the greater interest in a marriage relationship? Who expresses the greater interest when interest is expressed in current day marriages in the faith category? Uh, would you say it's the husband or would you say it's the wife? Well, let me give you some statistics. These marital statistics gathered through denominational studies. Now keep in mind, these numbers are not about any particular denomination, but about the statisticians, what the statisticians are calling spirituality in general, but denominations have conducted these studies. Which of the marriage partners is most interested in spiritual matters? Well, according to statistical analysis, here are the numbers. The typical U.S. congregation draws an adult crowd that is 61% female, 39% male. Now, I know as the emergent church comes into, into play and things change, this, these numbers are going to change. Um, but still, 61% female, 39% male before we had all the fun and games brought into the church. This gender gap showed up in all age categories, folks. Uh, on any given Sunday, there are 13 million more adult women, denominationalism tells us, than men in American churches. Um, this Sunday, uh, almost 25% of married church-going women will take part without their husbands, uh, according to statistical analysis. Midweek activities often draw 70 to 80% female par participants. Uh, the majority of the church employees are women, except for ordained clergy, uh, who are overwhelmingly male, but, and that's changing. Over 70% of the boys who are being raised in church will abandon the church during their teens and their 20s. Is that not an interesting statistic? Many of these boys will never return. More than 90% of America, of American men, believe in God. And five out of six call themselves Christians. Uh, but only one out of six attend assembly on any given Sunday. And these numbers are going down. They're not going up. The average man accepts the reality of Jesus Christ but fails to see any value in going to church. Uh, they understand there is a Christ, but why do we need to go to church? Churches, uh, churches overseas report gender gaps of up to nine women for every adult male in attendance. Uh, the typical Christian college in, US, in the U.S. enrolls two women for every one man, we're told. Now, those are some interesting statistics if you ponder those. Which of the marriage partners 
when it comes to religion to men general, has the greater interest in spiritual matters by what we've just seen? Obviously, it's the wife. Not in every case. Now, we understand that. We're not painting an overall uh, picture, direct picture here, but in most cases, it's the wives who are become most concerned with the spiritual well-being of their family, especially once children come along. It's the women, for the most part, who are interested in, uh, quote, unquote, going to church, uh, and when possible, dragging their husbands along with them. Um, in many cases, the husbands go, um, but with a greater desire to keep peace than to exercise their faith. Uh, ask any modern-day televangelist or the leader of any modern-day religious denominational system, for that matter, where the offerings come from, and guess what they'll tell you? Uh, if there were no women, there would be no church. Uh, are we downplaying the role of the woman in the local assembly? Uh, of course not, but is that not a sad state of affairs, especially in light of what Paul just told us about the woman's need for a safe place? Uh, to whom has God given the position of headship? Um, to the woman, or, or did he give it to the woman or did he give it to the man? We need to answer that. Who then is supposed to take the lead? Who's supposed to guide in matters of faith? Who is to provide that safe place, according to the Apostle Paul, to the woman uh, in this category called faith? Well, what, is, what does he tell us about that? Notice with me Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that, and now what are the next two words here? Look closely. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We're being told something here, folks. Here, here's another scripture from which we can glean some doctrinal principles. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, where Paul wrote, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now, don't jump off the bridge here. The direct context of this passage is the spiritual gift called the gift of prophecy, as that gift was being exercised prior to the completion of Paul's epistles. But there's something else that can be drawn from this passage. It's very important for us to note here. Watch as Paul continues the passage. But they, he's talking about the women here, are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now catch this as Paul continues in verse 35. And if they, talking about the married women, will learn anything... Uh, related to this previously unprophesied truth. Uh, that's, that's the direct context here. Let them ask their husbands at home, uh, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. You see, the women grab the ball and they run with it because the men, uh, for the most part, show, they're showing little interest in the game. Uh, when it comes to assemblies where rightly dividing the word of truth is concerned, the statistics may be altered a bit, but I wonder by how much. Uh, in far too many cases... The men are on the bleachers watching the women play ball when it comes to spiritual matters. And there's a reason for that, of course, and Paul talks about that in his second letter to Timothy. It has to do with that wonderful yet vulnerable emotional makeup of our women. According to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the women of this dispensation are going to be particularly vulnerable to doctrinal confusion when it comes to that issue concerning faith. They can and will be apt to fall for false doctrine, doctrine that has, as its basis, emotions, the makeup of the woman. Uh, on the, our apostles telling us, don't drop the ball, husbands. Uh, don't leave the field and don't be content to sit on the bleachers and watch. Your wives need a safe place in this realm called faith. No one can provide that safe place like you, the husband, can. A place of doctrinal safety is the believing husband's responsibility when it comes to the avenue of faith. How can a husband lead? if he has no knowledge of the Word of God? Uh, how can a husband lead if he has no interest in the Word of God? How can a husband lead in spiritual matters when worldly matters take precedence in that husband's mind? Uh, how can a husband lead the woman even if he does have an interest in spiritual matters if he refuses to attend an assembly where rightly dividing the Word of Truth is taking place? Uh, how can a husband lead if he acquiesces uh, to the desires of a wife who would rather attend where emotional satisfaction trumps doctrinal edification. Uh, how can a wife follow the lead of her husband, folks, uh, in the area of faith if her husband is unable to teach her at home what Paul's talking about when he speaks of the necessity of rightly dividing the word of truth and holding firm to the form of sound words the ascended Christ gave to, to Paul to proclaim? 
How can a husband lead when it comes to that issue of faith if that husband is following rather than leading for the sake of keeping peace? And how often do I see that today? What we must also understand is that Paul's writing to men and women of the faith. He's not writing to unbelievers here. He's writing to men of the faith. He's not telling women in general to follow their men in general when it comes to whatever faith persuasion to which those men or their parents before them perhaps have become accustomed. Paul's writing to those who do understand the gospel that he preached. And he gives the husband's direction lest we become complacent uh, when it comes to the most important area of our lives and our marriages. When it comes to the area of faith, Paul gives husbands great direction with his words here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, men. A direct reference to Paul's teaching, uh, teachings as the apostle of the Gentiles. Stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. Literally meaning act your part. Uh, perform your role. Be strong. Uh, the question all parents who understand Paul's unique ministry and message must ask themselves is how are we communicating to our children the importance that rightly dividing the word of truth holds in our lives? What will they be looking for when it comes to selecting that spouse to whom they will one day be joined? Uh, what will they know? How will they know what to look for in the importance that sharing a common faith will become in their marriage relationship uh, if, if they're not told these things, taught these things up front? Uh, Will it matter to them at all? Uh, my guess is to no greater, greater degree than it matters to their parents right now and, and uh, obviously to no greater degree than their parents are emphasizing and communicating these truths that are so important. All right, we've, we've looked at the area of faith and there's so much more that could be said regarding that faith realm. But for the sake of time, let's move quickly to the second area where marriage sundering occurs at an astounding rate today um, and where wives need a safe place. It's that broad range area called finance. Uh, we began with faith, but from this point on, we'll take these areas, categories, in the order that we discussed them earlier on. How about the area called finance? Well, many marriages, marriages become cracked, if not broken, to pieces because of conflicts that arise when it comes to issues related to finance. It, it's very easy for a space to come between husbands and wives in this important life realm. Uh, basic question is, how can a husband provide a safe place? For his wife, when it comes to money matters, and I needn't tell you it does, <laughs> uh, can a wife be made to feel unsafe uh, when it comes to family finance? Uh, here again, the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, a husband who understands headship will do his very best to see that that doesn't happen. Simple as that. Now, we know that a job today does not necessarily mean a job tomorrow. We understand that economies um, wane, they ebb. And, uh, so we're not talking about things over which a person has no control. We understand that national and local economies shift and change along with those, and along with those changes come openings and closings in the job market. A person can lose a job simply because a job ceases to exist. Uh, so there are a lot of things over which we have no control. But there's a real difference in having no control and refusing to control the things that we can. Uh, can a job be lost because a person refuses to control himself? Uh, sure it can, and it often does. A major mantra of the pride nature is it's not fair. You've probably heard it. Uh, and that it's not fair mantra often raises its head, cuts off the nose that belongs to the head, the head being the husband in this case. Now I can tell you how many times, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to guys who've quit a job because of, of discontent over how someone else was not doing their job and management refused to correct the situation. Uh, why must I toe the line when that person over there doesn't even have a line? is how some guys reason it. Uh, the scenarios are endless, folks, but whatever the situation, whether fellow employee conflict or management conduct, emotions, when emotions begin ruling the person, a job can be gone much faster than a new one can be gained, and that's often the, the case today. Does the Bible provide any, any uh, answer, any advice in that area? Well, certainly it does, and in, in numerous places, but how about Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, for just one example? Uh, there's much wisdom sitting in this passage. Here it is. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Uh, as you can well imagine, there's not a lot of stability, or I should say security, in a city that's broken down and without walls. <laughs> Apply the principle sitting in this biblical proverb to a man allowing his emotions to cost him his workplace position. 
And, and do you know what the first thing is that will enter that well, that, that wallless marriage relationship where the, where the wife is concerned? I can tell you it, it's not the sense of security that her husband should be providing her to the best of his ability. Insecurity becomes the order, order of the day for that wife. It's, it's one thing to have no job and to be willing and ready to work at whatever job keeps food on the table and a, a roof over the head, even if that means flipping burgers or greeting shoppers, uh, and even if it means putting up with less than perfect people uh, or a less than perfect employer. It's quite another to refuse to take a job you think is beneath your dignity while you sit back and wait for the right job to fall into your lap. It's, it's probably not going to happen. Emotions should never be the escape route that a man uses to come short in his God-given leadership role called provision. Uh, a wife can be made to feel extremely unsafe if her husband refuses to work or refuses to work on a consistent basis. And that sense of lack of safety, security, can, uh, can manifest itself in numerous and sundry ways in the marital relationship. Paul addresses this when he, when he wrote to the saints at Thessalonica. Uh, with these words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, the basic provision for food, shelter, clothing, are the husband's responsibility. It's as simple as that. It's cut and dry. Uh, ruling well, as one author put it, is not only standing before, it's also planning before. Uh, someone once said, many marriages crack up when the bill collectors crack down. Well, there's a lot of truth in that statement, as marriage counselors can attest. Irresponsible spending habits and insufficient saving habits by a husband who has the leadership role in the marriage relationship can result in the insecurity of the wife, especially when couples are, are struggling to make ends meet in the first place. And that insecurity will eventually trickle down to the children of that relationship who may ultimately keep that same ball rolling on the same track. Uh, young ladies here need to pay attention to this and they need to look for a man, they need to find a man who worked, who is working, who's kept a job. Uh, if he's not working and he hasn't kept a job, that's a red flag for our young, for our young, young women. But it, it can go all the way to the other extreme. Can a wife be made to feel unsafe? when money becomes the major focus of her husband's mind. Let's take it to the other end of the pendulum here. Sure she can. Some men live to work rather than work to live. Um, that's another side of the finance coin. You can see it, it, it can go both directions. Money can move out of the realm of provision and into the realm of obsession where some men are concerned. That in itself can lead to the insecurity of a woman who's married to a money-only minded man. Uh, and then we have the modern day marketing uh, marketers trying to sell us all uh, that we need uh, and the fact that we need it right now. They would tell us what our needs are. Uh, do we need sustenance, the sustenance that food supplies? Well, of course we do. Does that mean filet mignon and lobster? Uh, no, <laughs> not necessarily. Do we need shelter? Again, the answer is of course we do. Does that mean a penthouse on a golf course uh, or the ocean or a house beyond our means, whatever that house be? A house beyond our means because credit has been placed at our disposal. Ask the residents of more than 900,000 households or one in every 138 homes who received foreclosure notices back in the year 2010 alone. Uh, if, if biting off more than they could realistically chew was in actuality a need or a want when they bit off that, that house that was larger than they needed. And we've yet to mention the ease of the click and buy marketing that the internet provides for everyone. Uh, I think you can see how easy it is for married couples to extend themselves beyond their means. Husbands and wives alike can do so very quickly through emotional purchasing. Little to no prior planning uh, leads to emotional purchasing. Uh, and there's oftentimes no prior discussion, no direction uh, taken by husbands and wives, by young people when they get married. And that brings marriage instability in this area called finance. If Paul's correct, and I believe he is, it's the man's responsibility to provide for his household. Therefore, it's no less the man's responsibility to discern that which is affordable, given a couple's means, from that which is not. To know it ahead of time, to have a goal in mind, to have a plan in place, so that both marriage participants can work toward their common goal in harmony in this area called finance. A little research will show there are at least 250 Bible verses 
that provides sound principles that are directly, directly applicable to that area of work and finance. Uh, for instance, here's one from the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. I know you've heard this one. Uh, appears in verses 6 through 8. Uh, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. <laughs> Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Uh, that's the planning ahead idea that I just talked about. The apostle Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. The handout is stealing. Uh, always trying to find a way to get that money you never intend to pay back in the first place is stealing. Paul also said this in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, but if any provide not for his own, he's talking about your own family here, especially for those of his own house, his own household, speaking to the husbands in this passage, folks, that person hath denied the faith. He's denied the truth regarding working for, uh, for stability in the family, and he's worse than an infidel. Paul isn't saying this person is a non-believer and therefore unsaved. Paul is saying that this person is denying the sound doctrine that Paul has provided for those who've been given the responsibility of providing for their own. Um, these men are perfidious, is, is the definition of that word, uh, infidel. They're dishonest, according to a dictionary of the Greeks definition of the word that's been translated infidel. They're dishonest. Those who are not providing for their own households while capable of doing so are unfaithful when it comes to fulfilling their, their headship role in their marriage. And we could go on and on, but I know you get the point here. Let's conclude the finance realm of our marriage study and the safe place need for the wife within that realm with just a few questions. Understanding, of course, that we're tr by, we by no means are trying to exhaust this finance issue. Do our young men have the work ethic instilled in them by their parents in the first place? And if not, why not? Do they know that the basic need of every woman in her marriage relationship is a safe place and the area where do they know the areas where the wife is going to need that place of safety do they understand their God-given provision role uh, do our young ladies know the importance of avoiding a lifetime union relationship with a man who fails to understand his God-given responsibility of providing that safe place for his wife is she taught to consider the work ethic of the man before she marries that man uh, again the question is if not why not? Are both taught to discuss and come to agreement concerning their financial aspirations prior to the marriage union? Uh, what leadership principles that, that go along with the headship position in marriage are we teaching our young men? Uh, what qualities are we teaching our young ladies to look for in respect, uh, in that perspective, I should say, marriage mate? We can't expect them to, to succeed, folks, when more often than not, through our own example or lack of proper teaching, We've, we've taught them to fail. Um, well, let's move on to the safe place when it comes to the realm of family. Another major marital discord area. We'll just get as far as we can. As you can see, we're not doing an exhaustive study in any of these areas by any means, but we can try to hit on some of the more common problems that couples uh, relay to counselors. Just as with the area of finance, family-related issues have led to more than a few marriage breakdowns that eventually lead to marriage breakups. Um, it's very easy for a spouse, or for a space, I should say, to come between husbands and wives in that life realm called family. It's a broad-ranged area. Uh, we talked about some of the issues that can pop up in the family category in a previous message, children-related issues, as well as issues involving the in-laws, or as uh, jokingly we say, outlaws. Uh, they're, these are common areas of marital conflict. Let's begin with a statement by Paul here. It's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, a verse from our home text. For this cause shall a man, next three words, four words, five words, leave his mother and father and shall be joined unto his wife and the two of them shall be one flesh. Uh, let's consider the safe place once again and what we can glean from this passage. How safe can a wife feel if her husband, rather than being the head, rather than being the leader, remains under the leadership of one or both of his parents? Um, being directed rather than directing. Where is a husband's allegiance? You know, a, a wife can question that. A wife can begin to feel threatened. Does it surprise you that it's the husband who is told in Scripture, not the wife, but the husband, who is told to leave mommy and daddy and uh, be joined unto his wife? Why the man? Why the man and not the woman? 
Well, the truth is, Scripture states the same concerning the wife, but it's just stated in a different manner. Uh, keep in mind, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, Therefore, just as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be, the word subject is absent, but it's carried forward in the context, to their own husbands in everything. So the principle applies across the board. The man leaves his father and mother, but in the sense of the new union identity being established, so does the woman do the very same thing. Yet there's something worth noting here. While we've all heard of the father-son connection, father-son relationship, and as important as that relationship is between a father and son, there's a special type of a bond that often exists between mothers and sons. Uh, a bond that goes beyond that which can be properly explained. Uh, psychologists and social scientists have tried to explain it, but how many know what I'm talking about here? Dads love their sons and sons love their dads, or should, and there are countless father-son relationships, uh, stories that can be told, but do sons not often have a close and protective inclination when it comes to their moms? Why, sure they do. Someone has said to a mother, a son is never a fully grown man, <laughs> and a son is never a fully grown man until he understands and accepts this truth about his mother. Uh, that one you'll have to think on a bit, but in some sense, the umbilical cord remains attached with a lot of mothers and a lot of sons. Uh, don't think for a moment that mothers, uh, most mothers uh, that would be, are not attached to their daughters in a very strong way. We know that's true. But the mother-son bond is particularly strong. And it's, it's well, it's different. Uh, is about the only way we can express it. Someone else wrote, so there's this boy. He kind of stole my, stole my heart. He calls me mom. Well, that's true. You see any potential areas of conflict? when it comes to the safe place of a wife and the ongoing bond between a mother and son that we're talking about, can a father become jealous of that relationship and insecure in his own mind? Of course he can. The answer is yes, and that often takes place. And that, that will in turn affect the way that father deals with his son. Um, understand similar areas of conflict can arise in marriages due to this, that special and ongoing bond, that relationship that oftentimes exists between daughters and dads. We're going to take it the other direction now. But due to the more emotionally sensitive makeup of the woman, and we're speaking in generalities here, of course, I think you can see the unsafe place that can begin to take shape in a wife when her husband will defer to his mother rather than to confer with his wife. Uh, counselors often suggest that the, wi the wise thing for young married couples to do as they begin their lives together as, as a single entity is to move away, if possible, Put at least a little distance between them and their parents on both sides in order to establish a better sense of their own new oneness identity. I think it's a great idea. That distance for a time uh, and up front in the relationship can help a couple. That can help a couple to realize the importance of working uh, out their own problems uh, between themselves when they have no one else to confer with but one another. This is why it's important that a believing son, a believing daughter, choose correctly and be taught to choose correctly early on. Remember, Paul's only writing to believers, he's not writing to unbelievers, as he gives this leave and cleave direction to us. Believers shouldn't be marrying unbelievers in the first place, uh, according to Paul. Paul states this, by the way, in the form of command in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, what, what communicational connection, that's the idea with the word fellowship here, it's, it's matoke, what communication, what communicational relationship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communication, now he's using koinonia, another word for or fellowship, what communion, what positional relationship hath light or belief with darkness, meaning unbelief here. When problems occur in a marriage, and we're focusing on family-related issues at this point, but the same applies no matter what life realm that ha we happen to be discussing, God's word, rightly divided, must be the couple's authority, nothing else. The pastor cannot be the authority. The professional counselor cannot be the authority. Parents cannot be the authority. The one who designed the institution of marriage and the creatures who would participate in that institution, that one must be the authority. That is, if problems are to be prevented and marriage harmony is going to be preserved. A wise mother-in-law, or father-in-law for that matter, should be able and be willing to defer to their son-in-law 
when it comes to issues concerning their daughter. Now that's difficult, but it's true. Likewise, a wise mother or father-in-law should be able and willing to defer to their son when it comes to issues concerning his wife. Uh, a person, a, a parent should not interfere unless they see an endangerment to that son or that daughter. And then they must be very careful, very wise, when it comes to how they assist in resolving the problem. Of course, families, a broad-ranged category, as we all know, children and discipline. Another major area within the family category where marital conflict can and oftentimes does occur and where marriage relationship catastrophe can become the result. Can a wife be made to feel unsafe when it comes to her children and the discipline or lack thereof of her children? You bet she can and in a hurry. A lack of properly applied discipline and or punishment, and we'll try to explain the difference, is becoming increasingly more commonplace today. Discipline has to do with child training that leads to self-controlled, appropriate behavior. Discipline is an ongoing pr uh, pr process and it must be geared to a child's level of understanding. Discipline is child training geared to bring children to the point of being able to control or discipline themselves. Now, stay with me here. Punishment, on the other hand, has to do with intentional rebellious behavior. Willful misconduct, whether proper conduct is understood by the offender, yet totally ignored or purposely adversely practiced. That calls for punishment. So there is a difference in the two. It's important that parents understand the difference between discipline and punishment. Again, discipline has to do with appropriate and consistent instruction. Punishment has to do with willful and resistant, uh, resistant, or resistant rebellion. Persistent rebellion, I should say, by a child who understands full well the instruction that they've been given. Discipline and punishment work hand in hand. They're both necessary, but the two are different. A lack of understanding when it comes to the difference between discipline, that ongoing child training process, and punishment, uncomfortable consequences, where proper conduct is understood yet ignored in contrary fashion, can lead to the abandonment of punishment altogether. Let's just use discipline. Let's use no punishment whatsoever. Punishment has become a bad word in, in many circles today. And uh, in, uh, not because it's necessarily a bad thing, uh, but because it's been in far too many instances misunderstood and inappropriately applied. Punishment has been turned into retribution by angry parents today. Thus the tendency for some to call for the abandonment of punishment altogether. That's wrong. You're going to miss the boat here if you fail to punish when punishment is due. I know what I'm about to say here might be understood by some folks, but I'm not trying to defend anyone. It's time out, <laughs> not necessarily an uncomfortable consequence for our, our, every young person in today's world. How can a parent tell when time out is not sufficiently uncomfortable? It's not a sufficiently uncomfortable consequence. That's easy. When misconduct occurs over and over again, in spite of the child training or teaching through talking, we might call it, that has taken place on a level you know your child understands, uh, when that takes place and timeout doesn't work and it reoccurs, timeout's not an efficient punishment. How about Bible teaching on the difference in the two, punishment and discipline? Well, let's take a quick look. Proverbs 22.6 is a verse that talks about discipline or child training. Discipline means child training. Proverbs 22.6, great verse. You're familiar with it. Some of you can quote it by heart. Here it is. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Holy Spirit child trains believers today. And he does so through the word of God that he authored. He talk teaches us, we might say. He teaches us the way to conduct ourselves. We might say to control ourselves through the word that he's given us. Here's a statement from the Apostle Paul along these same lines. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. In this case, setting yourself apart that you should, you should abstain from fornication, that everyone should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. How should we know, how should we know how, which is a silly way to ask a question. Well, the answer is because the Holy Spirit's taught us how. Uh, how by a, a child training us through the word that he authored has worked. And how about this passage from Paul, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The written word of God is how God talks to us today. Therefore, it's how God child trains us today. This is the discipline aspect. We gain our instruction in righteousness from the word of God. We might, uh, we taught, we're taught to, by talk, 
written talk, we might call it, when it comes to God's discipline of us. But does that mean, God having supplied all the proper instructions we'd need through talk teaching, that he removes the negative earthly consequences that we can count on to, to, to reap as a result of improper choices that we make? No, he doesn't remove the earthly negative consequences. God allows us to reap the earthly negative consequences of the improper decisions that we sow. That's how he designed it to work in this dispensation. We bring the punishment, we bring the natural consequences of our improper decisions, we bring those upon ourselves. Some consequences may not be so painful, other times they may be extremely painful. The Bible talks about discipline or child training through instruction, Holy Spirit talking in written form today, of course, but does it not also talk about punishment for purposeful rebellion where our own children are concerned? It most certainly does. Remember, believers are adult sons, according to Scripture. We're not the little children anymore. So we're not, adult sons are not being uh, punished by God today. They've been disciplined, and now they're adult. We're, we're talking about believers, and we're admonished by the Word, uh, but we're talking about young, young children of believers at this point, and they do need punishment. They're not adult sons. How about these passages from the book of Proverbs? The word Proverbs mean, it, meaning short sayings with obvious truth. Proverbs, short sayings with obvious truth. Solomon, given great wisdom, and, and he's credited with the Proverbs. Many of you know these passages quite well. We'll just bring a couple up here. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Uh, Proverbs 23, 13, another great example. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Now, it's not talking about beating somebody within an inch of their life and uh, bruising them, leaving them black and blue and wounded and scarred. Understand the Holy Spirit's not telling people to inflict physical injury on their children. Uh, he's not teaching that parents are to harm their children physically or any other way for that matter. That's what modern day psychology would try to tell you the Bible is teaching. So they would say, throw it out, um, chuck it out altogether, but that isn't so, folks. No one, much less a believer, should resort to inappropriate punishment, uh, and many have done so, but should we abandon punishment altogether because some have inappropriately applied it and think that negative consequences shouldn't be applied? In what other areas of life might we make that mistake? Well, punishment must only be applied appropriately and only when called for, but should it be abandoned entirely because others punish inappropriately. There's, there's a name for punishment applied inappropriately and, and in anger. Do you know what that name is? It's called abuse. Uh, parents must be very careful, extremely careful. They not allow anger to become a part of the punishment picture. And the punishment should match the offense. Uh, some fathers employ the teapot method of correction. They have little to say until the top blows off. You may be one of them. I was one early on in my... Uh, raising my children, that can make a woman feel mighty unsafe, not to mention the children themselves. Uh, never knowing when he, she, or her children are going to face the wrath of Khan, um, this can have a permanent and damaging effect on the children. A father can unleash on a child, and he can do so with an attitude. And the unsafe feeling it brings to children and the adverse effects it can have later on in their lives is immeasurable. It's sad, but parents today tend to go to one extreme or the other, as unfortunate that, as that is. Some parents abuse their children through the improper use of, uh, of what is miscalled punishment as children are smacked, slapped, screamed at uh, for mistakes, for mishaps, for simply acting their age. Uh, and in some cases, the opposite extreme is true. Parents abandon any notion whatsoever that punishment can ever be properly uh, applied. And through a lack of appropriate negative consequence, they also abuse their children, but just in a different way. Uh, punishment should have a, a negative uh, aspect to it. Uh, in, the, in the idea of the, the one being punished. Inappropriate punishment, on the other hand, and a lack of set boundaries with set consequences, uh, they foster anger and insecurity in the mind of a child, who in reality needs those boundaries for emotional security. Listen to Paul's statement here in Ephesians 6, 4. Final passage. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We could go on and on. I'm sure you're well aware. The potential areas of conflict between husbands and wives within that broad based category called family is endless. But the inner relationships of parents and the rearing of children are two areas that marriage partners should discuss. They should be mutually agreed upon before they commit themselves to one another in what God intended to be a lifetime union. Uh, we can't 
say all there is to say. We'll leave it right there for our next message uh, where husbands can pr provide their wives a safe place in their marriages. And, uh, and by doing that, it enables the wife to respond to his love for her and then give him the due respect uh, that, that every husband is due. 